Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. We welcome Dean Kuntz and Tess Gerritsen to Live Talks Los Angeles. They'll discuss the writing life and Dean's new novel, Quicksilver. Dean is the author of 79 New York Times bestsellers, 14 of which rose to number one. And his books have been published in 38 languages and have sold over 500 copies worldwide. Tess has written 28 suspense novels with more than 38 million copies sold. Her books have been translated into 40 languages, and her series featuring homicide detective Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles inspired the hit TNT television series, Rizzoli and Isles. Hi, I'm Tess Gerritsen, and I'm so excited to be meeting one of my favorite authors, Dean Kuntz. Uh, We've never met in person, but I know him through his books which um, maybe or maybe not is an accurate portrayal of the real man. Uh, Anyway, it goes way back to Demon Seed when I first saw those posters uh, with Julie Christie and read the book and it's, it's, and I've been a fan ever since. Hello, Dean, it's great to meet you for the first time. Well, the same here. I've been a reader of yours as well, and uh, we've never had the pleasure of meeting face to face. I'm sure it'd be a pleasure for me to meet you. I'm not so sure how it worked the other way, uh, because I am a pretty dark human being. So, I, yeah, we we both are. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted. I'm. Um, we're here to actually talk about your your brand new book, which is Quicksilver. And it's, I think it's your best so far. Um, but then, you know, there are so many books, it's hard to decide. Um, and I'm going to give a little, a really quick synopsis for the people who haven't had a chance to read this fantastic book. Um, it's about a young man who never knew who his parents were. And he discovers that he has strange supernatural powers. He meets up with a young woman who's equally gifted and her grandfather. Then they're pursued by a secret government agency. And now they're on the run for their lives. And this odd trio heads out on a road trip to learn the truth about who they really are and to battle the coming evil that threatens all of humanity. So big stakes here. Anyway, the result is a really entertaining tale with a little bit of horror, but I think the best part about this book is that it's so funny. Um, I don't know if you intended it to be that way, but your characters are really, really funny. So um, I want to hear, and I know the rest of us want to hear, how this story came to you. You've written so many books. How did this one kind of, how did you give birth to this one? Uh, it's, uh, it is it is sort of like giving birth, isn't it? You go through the pangs. And <laughs> so, uh, this one was... Uh, I had written a book called The Other Emily, which was very dark, and uh, I needed to do something to uh, lighten the mood, I thought. Uh, And I knew that the next one would have to have humor in it. Uh, And where these things come from, I I think we both would probably agree. Sometimes you know, and sometimes it's it's, you're clueless. You get an idea, and it seems to have bloomed out of nothing. And in this case, I just had this image in my head of a bassinet on a lonely desert highway with a three-day-old baby in it. And of course, when I got that, first thing you think is, what's wrong with my mind? And then the second thing you think is, uh, oh, that's a story. But then what story? Because, and I thought, well, it's the story of this baby, but you can't do a novel from the point of view of a baby. You could, but it'd be pretty hard to sell it. And, uh, Then I thought, okay, it has to be maybe 19, and he's telling you about being found on this highway. But then what's it all about? Very quickly, it came to my mind that this was about somebody who wasn't wanted, obviously, when he was born, uh, and maybe grew up in an orphanage where nobody would ever adopt him. And now he's 19 and very 
appealing character. And suddenly every law enforcement agent in the country is after him. And when I had that, I thought this could be a lot of fun. It's going to be a road story. It's going to be picaresque. We're going to keep meeting these strange characters. He's not going to be a rogue. We're going to like him. And it just sort of evolved from there. I don't use outlines. So, uh, so I never quite know where it's going, but I had to imagine, uh, as you can guess, why are they after him? And until I knew that, I didn't want to start. And it took about 15 minutes. I won't give this away. Why is everyone after him? And the moment I knew, I broke out laughing. And I thought, okay, I have to write this now and see where it goes. So we're in the process. How far had you written when you suddenly realized um, why they were after him? Oh, I hadn't even begun writing yet. I, that, when I had that, then I knew I had to write. Uh, I had no idea otherwise where, where it was going, what was going to happen, uh, why he was so wanted. or It just it evolves for me. If uh, I, I have this thing. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, when I sit down to do it, I have to entertain myself. Uh, I have to love being here doing it, or otherwise I'll stop and... Uh, and come up with another idea. So uh, so I knew before I began. Then the question is, how does he escape from all of this and what ability might he have uh, that gives him a little bit of an edge? Though not enough that he ever escapes jeopardy. He has to constantly be in jeopardy or I don't have a story. So you didn't know then yet what all his abilities were. You, you had to, the way Quick, Quinn Quicksilver discovers his abilities is on the road. He actually finds out a lot of about himself as he's traveling. Is that the way it worked out for you? As you're, have you got them on the road? You find out what they can do? Absolutely. I, I, I work that way. It's like walking a tight wire sometimes. I didn't always work that way. Way back in the day, I had outlines. I, uh, I operated from them, uh, but I don't do that. And I haven't done it in a long time. Uh, I, I, I'm always terrified that I'm going to get very deeply into the book and not know how to resolve anything. But it always works out so far, and I'm wrapping with, with both hands. So you've never written a book where you get halfway through or two-thirds of the way through and said, and think, I've written myself into a corner and I don't know what to do? I've come close to that in the sense that I get, uh, I just recently finished a book about a woman who lives alone on an island and it, it evolves into much more than that. And uh, I was probably halfway through it and I thought, I wonder if this, and I was, I was really loving it. I thought it was one of the better things I've ever done. And then suddenly I thought, I wonder if I've got enough story here. I'm starting to look at this and I'm wondering, Am I going to get to where I need to get? And it didn't last terribly long. Uh, I think I spent a day or so slowing down and thinking about it. And then I realized where I thought the story would end with her triumph over something was not the end. In fact, it was about two thirds of the way. And when I realized that and what new thing was going to evolve out of this, then I became excited and went on with it. So, Fortunately, no, I've never had to throw anything in the trash can for a long, long time. In the early days, oh, yeah, yeah. And I've rewritten some books like Demon Seed that you mentioned, totally rewrote that book years later. And I looked at it and said, whoa, I'm glad they made a movie of it. But now I'm kind of amazed they did. Now you have to update it because computers have gotten better. Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, I, I want to bring in um, a theme that uh, you and I sort of emailed about earlier. Um, and you you draw on um, really a very ancient religious um, sort of legend about the Nephilim. And I'm as, as soon as I saw the name, I thought this is a derivation of Nephilim. Do you want to talk about where you <coughs> heard about that and how that works into this plot? Well, I you know, I, I think I said to you, my brain is a junk shop. And <laughs> I, I don't know where so much of what's in there came from. I just know that I heard about that a long, long time ago. And it was always, I guess, must have been back there in the back of my mind in the subconscious. I changed the spelling a little to be like, uh, to uh, associate it with nihilism. And uh, 
because that's what these are, very nihilistic creatures. Uh, and this is a book I wanted to have. You know, I I'm, I'm mash up genres somewhat. I, I have for decades. Uh, and when I first started doing it, publishers just didn't like it at all. Uh, and I think this is the first time I've actually introduced an element of fantasy based on it, some existing world uh, mythologies. And uh, so uh, I wanted to use the Nephilim for that uh, uh, purpose and to tie in with certain other mythological elements they use during the story. Um, but where they come from, wow, I don't know. I, I dedicate this book to uh, four writers who had influence on me when I was a kid in high school. Uh, and sometimes you know where you get your influences and things come from. But other times I haven't, I, as again, as I said, no clue. You know, for those viewers who don't even know what we're talking about, <laughs> you know, what are the Nephilim? Do you want to give them a little clue about what, the background of that? Not, no. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I'm going to tramp on something in the story. So let okay, me yeah, yeah, that's, it's so hard to talk about a book without yeah. without um, giving away too much. Um, yeah. But but just you know, suffice it to say, this this draws deep into very very ancient mythology, and I think that's that's what fascinated me the most about this. The other thing you draw on though is um, the the boy. Um, Quinn is raised uh, in in a nunnery, really in a con with uh, sisters of the poor Claire's, um, and you have very affectionate descriptions of what this order of nuns is like. Do you want to talk about how Catholicism weaves in and out of this story as well as your previous books? Well, he's uh, he's he's sent off to an orphanage. She He's found outside this little town of Pepto, which doesn't exist, but it is kind of like a lot of small Arizona towns. And, uh, and he's, there's nowhere for a three year old baby there. There's no child care, anything to help. So he's sent to this, uh, uh, orphanage run by poor Claire's in Phoenix. Uh, and they take him under his wing and something tragic happens to him there. Uh, uh, he's, he's witness or maybe not witness, but, uh, he has a great loss there that psychologically almost ruins him. And one of the nuns is a psychologist. And one of the things that's fascinated me about nuns, about monks, I have a close relationship with an order of Norbertine monks. And among them are like five or six people with degrees in physics. And it's fascinating to me how enormously educated these religious uh, orders are. And that's something I think most people don't understand. So this, what almost gives uh, uh, Quinn the greatest hope is not, in fact, to a degree it is her faith, but it's more the fact that she's a trained psychologist and she sets out to help him get over this idea of why there's evil in the world. And the book sort of deals with the existence of evil. And, uh, and she lays it out in a way I was, I had fun doing. It's little moments of the past. And it's given to you in four or five, not terribly long sections. Don't worry, but I think there's a lot of deep psychology going on for 30 pages at a time. Uh, but, uh, she reaches into her sectarian or secular education as well as a religious education to bring him out of his depression. And I thought that was a sort of fascinating thing I wanted to explore. It, it is interesting though, I, that some of the best universities in the country are run by uh, Franciscans, for instance, medical schools, and some of the best astronomers actually can be found in the Vatican. So um, you're, you're, you know, it's a, it's a good point um, that we, we forget that they are scientists mm -hmm. as well. Um, there is a, um, sort of this pre-apocalyptic mood in Quicksilver. I don't know, it reminded me a little bit of some of the Terminator films where you know you know the bad thing is coming and what do you do about this? So um, I, I was wondering how much you drew from current events like the pandemic and Jeffrey Epstein and political turmoil. Is, is, I, feel, I mean, it just feels like there's a sense of doom over the whole thing. Did you, did you find current events um, in any way... Uh, um, affected the story? Well, you know, uh, I'm an old guy. I've been around a long time. And the thing that kind of amazes me 
is that for a significant part of my life, uh, there has been in this country, maybe the worldwide, I can't speak for that, but there has been this apocalyptic mood. Uh, I mean, I can remember the late 60s when there was a panic about the next ice age was coming. Uh, and then there was the acid rain issue. And then there was, of course, global warming and uh, climate change. And there was the Y2K panic. I can remember when everybody was saying, oh, when that when that midnight second clicks over, all the nuclear missiles will be launched at once because nobody will be able to stop it. Uh, and it goes on and on. Uh, it, it's amazing to me how much people and, and the whole idea of zombies and how big a thing that became. Uh, there is this mood and I wanted to explore that a little bit. I've done that in, uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, and in this book that I mentioned about this woman alone on an island, it, it speaks very largely to, to this same issue. Uh, it, it fascinates me to a great degree that, and I think part of what I was uh, saying in this is that uh, sometimes we focus on all the wrong things. We're afraid often of all the wrong things to be afraid of because we don't wanna focus on what's really scary in life. And what's really scary in life is the stuff that has happened to human beings before there were all these threats that we now seem to recognize. Uh, and that is uh, cancer, uh, the loss of a loved one, uh, the, the fragility of our own lives. And I wanted to say in this story, yes, there is this uh, apocalyptic mood about everything and evil is real in the world. But when you get down to who the villains are in the story, one of them is basically Jeffrey Epstein. And this is nothing that we've ever had a panic about, but it's something that's endemic anymore to our society, this level of child molestation and so forth that we see everywhere. So part of the book is to say, yeah, there's this apocalyptic mood, but look at what they're actually having to fight. It's stuff that isn't going to destroy the world, but will destroy our communities and our society if we don't deal with it. You, you, um, as in other books, you deal with the nature of evil. And in this particular book, you sort of postulate that evil is inborn in some people. It's not made, it's there. And it's, and sometimes it's, it just springs forth from people, um, from childhood, I suppose. Do you, do you feel that, that there are people that are pretty much born evil? I, you know, it's a difficult question to answer. I, some of it is absolutely no question nurture. Uh, more than nature. And some of it has to do with societal ills that uh, drive people to do bad things. But I grew up under the thumb of a violent alcoholic father uh, who had a lot of, uh, in his youth, had a lot of good options in his life. His own father was successful, um, but he became very dark. And, uh, and he was always threatening to kill himself and us uh, my mother and me. And I never knew whether he could do that or not. Uh, but I had to, later in life, it came to me to support him for 14 years. And we moved him to California, not into our house. I was never going to have that again. But, uh, but we put him in an apartment we oversaw him. He ended up in a psych ward twice. And the second time was diagnosed as sociopathic. Now, we don't understand sociopathic personality. We understand them to the extent that we, we know they don't have human feelings. Uh, they fake them very, very well. And that was the way my father was. So in that sense, if it's somebody who was born sociopathic, then you could say that's as good a definition of evil as I can think of. But we don't really know that. We don't know how sociopathy falls. But I can say, as I look at the world, some evil is totally explainable and some of it is not. And that that is not explainable uh, uh, is pure evil in operation. And it's not, it's not modern to think that evil exists as a pure force in the world. But I'm sorry, I see it. It's there. Uh, I wish it weren't, but it is. And I think you have to face that if you're ever going to work adequately against it. Well, you do wonder about the biological basis of this. I, I 
remember re- hearing from one, one bear expert, I mean, bears, bears in the way of animals, um, that maybe one out of most bears will not be aggressive, will not bother human beings, but one out of 15 to one out of 20, they are killers. And it almost makes you wonder whether we have that same proportion um, it, when it comes to human beings as well. They're just different. They are born different. And those are the ones we have to watch out for. Uh, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, you know, my father was, and, and the thing about that is, when I said they're so good at faking human emotion, my father could, he, he couldn't hold a job because he'd punch the boss out. Uh, never a career advancement move. But, uh, but he could get people to invest money in companies to b- uh, build and sell inventions he made. And the inventions were totally nuts. Uh, no one with his right mind would have put money up to, for these inventions. I mentioned one was, uh, he invented uh, this and he showed it to me. It was, I, can't, I would say a console model television, but a lot of people no longer knows what, know what that is. Let's say it was a machine about three to four feet square, a big square machine, four feet high, four feet on the side with a little hole in it and a hook. And when you pull the hook out, you hook that into an eyelet that you screwed into a door frame. And you turned on the machine and this heavy engine started rumbling and it turned the jump rope. And he had invented the world's first electric exercise machine. Uh, and I remember saying to him, but dad, a jump rope, half the exercise is in the upper body. It's turning the jump rope. And he got very angry with me. And he said, this is for people who want to exercise, but not too much. <laughs> and and I, I, I was still not sold. And then he, then he got angry and he said, this is the first exercise machine a blind person can use. And I was <laughs> utterly mystified. And he pointed out that every time the rope reached the apex of its arc, a bell rang. So if you were blind, you knew when the rope was coming down. Uh, and, and I would think no one would put up money for this, but literally this is, this is 50 some years ago. He got over a hundred thousand dollars of investor oh money. Now imagine what that is today. I don't know. It's yeah. certainly at least a million. Uh, he drank it all away, spent it on women and uh, drank it all away and gambled it all away within about six months. And we never saw a dime of it. And he did that again and again. He, he never, if he built the machines, they said in the warehouse, sometimes he never built them. Often they came after him. He ended up in jail a few times, but they never held him more than a day or two. He never got successfully sued civilly because we never had anything for them to take from him. And yet he was so, he could be, I never saw the side, but everybody would tell me, your father is so charming. And it was like, do you know the person I know? Uh, and no, they didn't. Uh, and I didn't know the person either, but he could charm them. And that's the problem with sociopaths. Uh, they're very, very good at this and they can make themselves seem like your best friend when in fact they're your worst enemy. Yeah. But do you, did you ever meet, um, author David Morrell? I've met David only once, I think it was, but we've corresponded over the years. Well, you know, he, he said once to me that writers, and, and he was generalizing, but I, I found it very true for me that we writers are when we write our books, we are often addressing some major childhood trauma, something that was sort of central to what made us become writers. And this appears again and again in our books um, and hearing you talk about your father and hearing you and, and seeing how you've you've addressed good versus evil all the time. Um, how much do you think that that's true, that that childhood um not only influenced you into becoming a writer, but also the themes that you explore. It's absolutely true. Uh, And, you know, you don't know it necessarily from the time you start writing. Sometimes it takes many years to know. And in fact, in my case, a couple of different things influenced me. First time I was ever in a major magazine feature was for Watchers and People magazine did a three or four page spread in the days when they did larger pieces. And they sent a photographer after the reporter and he was to be there for two days taking pictures. And we were 
working for about an hour. And he finally said, let's take a break. Uh, and I never had worked with a photographer before, so I, I thought this was normal yeah, after one hour. And he sat down with me, got coffee, and he said, I want to tell you something about you, yourself. And I had never spoken about this publicly. He said, one or both of your parents was an alcoholic and one or both of your parents were violent. And I looked at him. I said, how can you know that? And he said, because I had a violent alcoholic parent and you're exhibiting all the behavior of an adult child of an alcoholic. And I said, what is that? And he said, in the nicest way, since I walked through the door, you've tried to control every picture I set up because you had no control in your childhood. And as an adult, you want to exert control. That was I to me. Uh, and he said, you do it in the nicest way. You're not mean about it, but you're always trying to make sure you're in charge of the situation. And then some years passed and an editor said to me, you know, at essence, uh, your books are also different from one another in different genres and everything and mixes. And yet in so many of them, there is at the same element. And I said, what is that? I'm starting to think this is a criticism, but she didn't mean it that way. She said, in so many books, it's about someone who has no family. And in the course of the story, makes a new family by people he meets and they become an unconventional family. And I stopped and thought about it. My God, was that true? It happens so often in my books. And I think that is in a way things I've actually done in my life too. Uh, and yeah, it's, you're working out things. It took me not to go on and on on the same question, but you've opened up a door here. <laughs> and uh, it, it's also true that um, uh, I, I, as a kid, I, books were what I escaped into at the age of eight uh, to get out of that house. And it was what showed me, you know how funny it is when you grow up in such a dysfunctional environment, you think everybody else is the same. You, you think every friend you have or anybody, their house inside is just like yours. And it was through books that I discovered, no, there were other ways to live. There were other kinds of families, and that might sound strange, but that's how I discovered it. And books became not only escape, but a guide to other ways to live. Yeah. So you were you were a bookworm. Obviously, you've been a bookworm all your life. But when did you you know you wanted to be a storyteller yourself? How how young were you? Well, uh, I was around the age of eight. I started writing historical stories, I've talked about this, drawing covers, stapling the side, putting electrician's tapes over the staples so nobody had hurt the fingers, and peddling them at her relatives for a nickel. I was publisher, writer, editor, agent, uh, bookseller. Um, why I was doing that, because I didn't even understand the, the, the business of publishing. Time passed, I was in college, uh, I was giving no thought about being a writer. I was going to be a teacher. And then uh, a professor, without telling me, submitted a short story I'd written for class to this Atlantic Monthly Yearly College competition that won a fiction prize. And uh, I, it was great for one reason. I was never the best student. While they were assigning things to read, I was reading what I wanted to read and faking all the stuff that I was supposed to have read. And, uh, uh, but suddenly that happened toward the end of my junior year. My senior year, I didn't have to do anything. I got straight A's in all my courses because I was the guy who won the Atlantic Monthly Prize. And I, I thought, this is cool. This gives you all kind of cachet that I never had. And then I turned around and sent the story to a magazine that paid me $50 for it because there was no prize money in Atlantic Monthly, just a certificate. And when I got that $50, that's when it started. I started thinking, I was a very poor kid. I had to work my way through college because I had a, a nighttime job from uh, uh, four days a week from uh, nine o'clock to four in the morning for 
three years when I was in high school, I was a stock boy in the supermarket, stocking the shelves as the stores closed. And uh, uh, so suddenly I thought, you know, I like doing this. I like writing. And you can make a living at this. I don't know what I thought all these writers were doing it, you know, just for the fun of it. But uh, that started me thinking. So it was a slow process. I'm, I'm a little slow and it takes some time. Well, you know what I love? The fact that you are, I mean, I'm not, and I'm saying this with high, highest praise because this is what I am. We're genre writers in a way. We're not, mm-hmm. we're not literary writers. And so much of what we learn in college is, is geared towards, is it literature? Um, they don't think about the fact that, that, that we want an audience as well. And so I, my question to you is, is, is being such a master of genre literature, of, of being a, a, an entertainer, um, do you need to, does anybody need, need to go and get a master's in, in writing, in a writing program, um, or should we just be teaching ourselves by reading books? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I look at genre and literary. Literary is just another genre. Uh, I love the English language. I love doing interesting things with it. I love dealing with the same things that we deal with in literary fiction. Uh, uh, I, I don't really recognize, uh, I think the best work in any genre is equal to the best work in literary fiction. Uh, but since the academic community has taken over the definition of what's good or bad, uh, you don't get to decide that. Uh, I would have to say that to write well, I had to unlearn most of what I was taught in writing classes. So I would say to somebody, what most taught me was the huge amount of reading I'd done. And when I talked to young writers around the way, I often point out when my wife and I were first married, we didn't have any, we were married with a used car and $150 and we each had a job. Uh, and we couldn't afford a television set for at least four or five years. And then we didn't buy one for another three or four because uh, we didn't want one. But we bought paperback books. So in those days, we, 50 cents, 60 cents for a paperback. And uh, and we read each of us about 200 books a year because we would spend all our evenings that way. Uh, and it was cheap entertainment. But I read in every genre. And the more I read in every genre, the more I wanted to write in all those genres. Well, you, wrote, you have I, read in every genre. <laughs> I have. It, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I learned something about you that... that um, I immediately recognized myself, but you were a fan of horror films as a child. Um, and, and, and you, and I read something about you loved that movie, them, which was one of my favorite movies as a kid too. So how did, how did horror play into this um, at, in your childhood? I mean, how did that inspire you as a writer? You know, I think why I gravitated to it, you know, I can't watch bloody movies. My wife will testify to that. If they get really bloody, no, thank you. Unless it's a Ryan Perry violent comedy, and then it's not real blood, uh, not Ryan Perry, uh, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that I gravitated as a kid to those, those great old universal films, Frankenstein, uh, The Mummy, uh, Dracula, uh, because uh, it was worse than what I was living in. <laughs> so it's kind of in some strange way a relief. Now, until I was well into my 30s, I had nightmares involving the Frankenstein monster. And eventually, I got wise enough about life and about myself to understand that it really wasn't the Frankenstein monster. It was a version of my father that I was dreaming about. And uh, and they, that kind of film, just, it's, they're cathartic. And especially if you've got violence in fear in your daily life. Here's something worse. And uh, so I think that's why I started. I've always disliked the label horror. So uh, I never allowed publishers to put it on the books, but reviewers sometimes did. And publishers publishers would sneakily put it in the catalog copy, but but I didn't see it and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so uh, and I still love a really good, scary movie, The Quiet Place. I really like. And, uh, you know the class, and, and I just have to bring this up because I, I, it's, it's um, 
the one that scared me the most as a child. It's the original one with Kevin, Kevin McCarthy, the invasion of the body snatcher. Mm-hmm. And um, no violence, as you mentioned, I don't like bloody films either. But the psychological aspect of that particular movie where you wake up and your mom is no longer your mom, even though everybody thinks it is, or your dad is no longer your dad. Um, I think that for a child, that that whole metaphor of, of alienation was what was terrifying. So what was the scariest horror film that you remember from your childhood? Uh, I actually wrote an introduction to a book about that film. Uh, that would maybe right up there as the scariest one when I was a kid, uh, because it was it felt so real. Uh, and of course, the novelist, uh, Jack Finney, that uh, it was based on his work, was a pretty darn good novelist and did in different genres as well. It was very adaptable, flexible. Uh, and, you know, that's one film that when it was remade years later with... Uh, uh, Nicole Kidman. Uh, yeah, well, they remade it there, and that was not a bad movie. But the one that was made with Donald Sutherland that was oh, in yeah, San right, Francisco, right, right. that one was really terrifying also. So yeah. there is an element in that story that I think is eternal. Uh, I think they could make that again, and it would still work. Uh, so um, just based on the books that I've read of yours, you are, and, and you've mentioned this, you are a wildly omnivorous reader. Um, and you read, well, you have a, an attic full of, of, of junk, you said. <laughs> you just, I mean, that's the way I think writers are. We just collect things. We collect all kinds of weird things, and then we put them together and, and create a new, a new sort of um, invention. So while you're doing your omnivorous reading, whether it's you know, medieval literature, what makes something jump out at you and tell you, I'm going to use this? You know, I did- there's something intuitive about it. I'm sure you would think of the same way. Uh, you can analyze, is this a good idea or not? But if there isn't this kind of strange internal reaction when the first idea occurs to you, it probably isn't going to go anywhere. And, and sometimes it's, it's monumentally strange where it comes from. When I wrote Odd Thomas, I was working on another novel. I was halfway through it. And this line that became in a variation of it, the opening of Odd Thomas, came into my head and had nothing to do with what I was writing. But I knew it was interesting and I didn't want to forget it. And I wrote, started to write it down. And though I'd never before since written anything longhand, I wrote the whole first chapter right there and then in longhand. It took me about two days. And I knew this is strange. Where is this coming from? Uh, some of them come to you. I was coming back from meeting studio executives on a project and I was in a bad mood, which is normally how you come back out of the Hollywood meetings. And I was in my wife's SUV and she had a deck of uh, CDs on and it was Paul Simon and Simon and Garfunkel and a song came up called Patterns and the line in it was, my life is made of patterns that can scarcely be controlled. And, you know, it, it's just a click there and you go, yeah. That's an interesting thought. Uh, and I love Paul Simon anyway. So I'm thinking and thinking about it. And on the drive home, I just evolved this little story and became the novel Life Expectancy. So uh, it's mysterious where it always comes from uh, and how you know it's something that's going to work. And sometimes you think to yourself, this can never work. I remember when I... I came up with, I was reading a lot of quantum mechanics and I was fascinated with the interconnectedness of all things, which quantum mechanics shows you, you know, the butterfly effect, how a flight of butterflies on one end of the world can affect the weather on the other end, how experiments in two labs at opposite ends of the country can affect each other uh, and all the mysteriousness about the way the universe is crafted. And I thought, one day, human relationships are exactly the same. Anything any of us does affects people we'll never know about. A good deed done may influence somebody else to do something nice to somebody else, which will change that person's life, at least for a short period of time. How all of that, and I thought, I got to write a novel about that. I got obsessed with it. But I thought, how on earth can I possibly do that? Uh, and then once I got into it, it became a year-long endeavor, a quarter of a million words or more, but it came out okay. And when we talk about genre or literary, it's funny, 
it was one of the best reviewed books I've done. And we had uh, one particular review, Boston Globe, I think it was, uh, said it was a literary miracle and went on to review it as a literary novel. My publisher at Vandom was adamant we couldn't use that. It could not be put in advertising. It will turn off readers. And I thought, ah, oh, so you achieved something you would sort of like to get certain kind of recognition. Now you do the publisher says no, no. But my editor thought to put it on the cover. So it's, you know, be careful what you wish for. It may not be what your publisher is wishing for. Well, it, it's funny how you're describing, you know, you, you come across some weird little fact or some little factoid. And it is the emotional punch that sends it onto this journey of being a story. Um, and and it's, okay, so we're talking uh, of, about computers, or we're talking about the butterfly effect, and that's that to me is a very intellectual, um, an intellectual uh, thing. But then when you move it onto the human element, and you feel that what I call the punch in the gut again, that's when it becomes a story. And maybe that's why your your publisher knew that literary is much more intellectual, whereas genre and entertainment is much more on a human emotional level. And that's what we want to read. We don't want to read necessarily about the physics behind the butterfly effect. No, no. And that's certainly not what I do in the book. It's all about right. emotional. Right. <laughs> so I'm, not, but, I'm into, the, into technique now, because I know there are probably people watching this who want to be writers. Um, and maybe this is maybe this is a, a, a delicate thing to ask, but can storytelling be taught? <sighs> it can be self-taught. I know that because that's what I did. Uh, and it was self-taught through reading other writers. Uh, when I say that, I think you understand exactly what I mean. It's it's not that you study them, uh, looking to see what is he doing here and how is he doing it. It's you, when you're reading something and loving it, you start to absorb things. I think what, what matters and is a value that you learn from other writers is the stuff you almost don't know you're learning. It just start, you start absorbing it. I can remember when I first found John D. McDonald, read 34 novels in 30 days and did nothing else except me. Uh, and then I wrote a novel that sounded just like a John D. McDonald novel, so I had to throw it away. Uh, but what, what I was, what I picked, one thing I picked up from McDonald, and you are a writer of character as well. I, not your personal. I know you have great personal character too, but you, you're very good with character and it, you care about character. And there are writers who don't. It, it's about plot more than anything else. But if you care about character, uh, and that's what you feel is the heart of fiction and one big piece of it. Uh, McDonald taught me without my realizing until a couple of years later that character was centered in his work and it's what compelled you to read it. Uh, it wasn't even the stories as good as they might be sometimes. And I'm not talking about the Travis McGee. I'm talking about all the standalones, which I think were his best work. And uh, he could stop a story for three or four pages and give you a character background and I remember first encountering that saying, get on with the story. I don't want all this. And then by the end of, I got to the end of the four pages, I found myself saying, no, I want to know more about the character. That was eye-opening to me as a writer. So can you teach it? Uh, I suppose a brilliant teacher can. Uh, and I don't know that a teacher even knows how to, needs to know how to do it himself or herself. Uh, uh, but I just never had an experience of that. What I had experience of was being autodidactic um, and sort of what I've been all my life. If I am interested in it, I can teach it myself, but I, ha I get my backup when I have somebody teaching it to me. I don't know. It's a personal flaw. One of many. What, what, um, what separates the publishable manuscript from the unpublishable? What's the best advice any editor ever gave you about that? Mm. Well, uh, I've evolved. I don't know any the particular piece of advice that Penner gave me was universal. But uh, in reading a lot of uh, other writers on it, there was a point where, you know, I had friends I knew and people I knew said, I've written a novel, could you look at the manuscript and they've got to say yes. Uh, and so you begin to see what the mistakes are that you've gotten past before you've ever were publishable. And uh, 
there are certain things that help a lot. Now, almost anything that say, don't do this, they're going to find a writer that does it and has succeeded. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking, it enhances your, improves your chances enormously if you don't do these things. And one of them is if you're writing multiple viewpoints, this is something I see all the time. Uh, they will not stay in one viewpoint within a scene. Uh, they'll go into two or three characters' heads within the same scene. And that breaks the boundaries of the fiction. It, it makes you, it shows you the author's hand. And that's a hard thing for some early writers to get their heads around. And then, of course, too many colorful dialogue tags. Uh, I, I've seen work in which nobody ever says anything. She exclaimed excitedly and, yes. and he <laughs> roared with anger and that, you know, problems like that, which I, I once said to somebody, uh, why did you do this or that? Uh, do you, haven't you noticed in all the reading of them? I've discovered that a lot of people want to be writers don't read very much. And that surprised me. Uh, and I, oh, well, I, I don't really like to read that much. Uh, I thought, well, then what do you want to be a writer? I think they think it's easier than you and I know it is. Yeah. And it, it looks easy. It's sort of like the acting of Cary Grant. If you do it smoothly, everybody thinks you're not actually writing. That was just something you typed out. And Cary Grant would be the best actor in film, but he never win awards because it looked too easy. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's like it's it's like being a good gymnast. It makes it, they you think that you can fly the way these young kids can, and uh, <laughs> it takes work. Um, you know, um, you had mentioned a little earlier about your driving away from a meeting in Hollywood and feeling very annoyed. Do you want to talk about what it's like, your ups and downs with the film industry, and what your experiences have been selling stories to Hollywood? Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or maybe we've not. Got, <laughs> we've got five TV deals right now with some wonderful people. So my hope is that uh, that my film agent and my book agents who colluded on this have finally put me with the right kind of talent. And I'm hoping that is true. I had a couple of good experiences with Steve Sommers, the director, who was so distraught. Mummy, after- right? The mummy? Mummy, uh, <laughs> mummy too. He made the best of a very thin anybody's made. <laughs> Uh, and we worked on the autonomous film together. I absolutely love Steve. He is an absolutely sweet human being. There's no funniness to him. But he was, he was so fed up with what happened in that. I think he just left the film industry. He said he was going to, and I haven't seen him out there any more since. And, and it had to do with the dishonesty of the business, the film. He wrote a brilliant script, raised the money to make it $30 million. And then let's just say, not all the money showed up for him. And, and halfway through the picture, he was told to shut it down and not go forward. And he put some of his own money in, found some other money. Never had enough to finish it properly, but still did a pretty good job. I, I've worked, I, I've written, I think it's about 10 screenplays, all 10 of which got greenlighted. And then I think only two of them ever got filmed because I, there was this one case where I was working with very hot producers. They said, this is my favorite story to turn people off wanting to be screenwriter. <laughs> uh, they said, uh, we're going to send this out. It got greenlighted from the studio. Studio said, we don't even need second draft. Get a director and do a draft for the director. Great. So they said, we're going to send this out to 40 or 50 directors. We'll be very lucky if we get two or three that say they want to do it. They came back, they had, I think it was 14 that wanted to do it. And there were some good names in it. So I got extremely excited uh, and against my better judgment. And uh, and then they called me up one day and said, we've got our guy. And I'm not going to use a name, but he had directed one or two cult films that had a cult following and were exceedingly violent. And this movie wasn't going to be anything like that. And nevertheless, I always want to give somebody benefit of that. Went into a meeting. These producers had a bungalow in the studio a lot. Went into a me- meeting with this guy. He showed up half an hour late. His shoes weren't tied. The laces weren't tied. And he came into the room and says, where's your bathroom? They had their own bath in this bungalow. He goes into the bathroom. He comes out. 
And it looks like he's been eating little powdered donuts because he's got all the white sugar oh. over his nose. <laughs> and he starts talking in the most insane manner through the next hour, in which he gets up a couple more times to go to the bathroom and comes back with a little more powdered donut <laughs> residue. <laughs> and I'm sitting there just, it's hilarious how bad the stuff he's saying is. And then he says, uh, well, that's what I've got to say, and I've got another meeting to get to. And he leaves, and I'm there with the two producers. I think we're all going to say, okay, we're going to find somebody else. But no, they say, isn't he brilliant? Oh, and no. I, I said, he made no sense at all. And one of them said, oh, he started in, in little theater uh, and uh, experimental theater, and he's a genius, and we don't. When we're not geniuses, we don't understand everything they say. And I said, no, you know what? A real genius is a real good communicator. Uh, <laughs> this guy was incoherent. Uh, and I couldn't get them changed. They stayed with him. The thing never got filmed. They brought, I said, I won't work with him because this is going to be a nightmare. And then, of course, they said, if you don't work with him, you'll never work in this town again, which I thought was so funny. I, I had a laugh. And... Uh, and the whole thing spiraled in completely. And that kind of thing happened so often. I finally said, uh-uh, I'm going to stay with novels and I'm not going to do this anymore because you waste so much of your time. Yeah. Oh, that's a nightmare. But, you know, is, is it any wonder that screenwriters are among the most happy, unhappy writers in the <laughs> world? They all want to be novelists and no wonder they can't control anything. That's totally right. Uh, it's... Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I've only told it, I think, once or twice before, and it, it'll be my only other story of, of Hollywood. Uh, but I was working, I wrote a, well, I wrote a novel called Phantoms, and it sold to film. It was an outright sale. And a couple of years went by, and the people bought it, didn't make it. And then one day, my, I had, uh, my agent for my action, my, entertainment law attorney got a call from Bob Weinstein who said, I have bought the rights from the people who bought it. I'm going to make this movie in the imprint dimension films. I think it was called it Miramax. And Dean has to write the script. And at that point I said, you know, I'm just not writing scripts anymore. And he kept coming back with a higher offer for film rights, for the screenplay rights. And finally I thought, Okay, you can't keep turning down when they just keep elevating the amount they want to pay you. And my my attorney was smart enough to put in, we would not surrender and jump to relief, which you always do when you're writing for Hollywood, which meant that if they breached my contract, I could shut the picture down. Well, Bob had me write to two drafts and a polish. I wrote one draft. He said, write it for 16 million. I wrote it. He he, he said, I love this. I'm going to go out and cast it. I don't need you to work on it till I cast it and get a director. And then a year and a half went by and I never heard from him. And one day I got a call from the line producer who said, would you like to see the shooting script? <laughs> <gasps> oh, no. Yeah, and I said, yeah, I would. Uh, I'd love to see the shooting script. And it was by a completely different writer. So we had to say, okay, we're invoking a jump for leave. But they had a crew in Colorado. They hadn't cast a single role, but they had a crew and they were building sets. Uh, and they had a director who hadn't directed a major film. Before. So Bob finally had to go back and go back to my script and have me bringing the budget down. And I did. And then he wasted a lot of money by having the right scenes that he would shoot, and then he, I would say, Bob, these are never going to work. And he'd shoot them, and, and they'd say, these don't work. And they'd never end up in the movie. So it ended up costing $16 million, but they wasted $4 million of it, oh, my estimation. Here's well, the joke. I'm, I'm, here's the yeah. joke I'm getting. It gets to the movie, gets shot. It's got some good things and some bad things. And Bob wants me to do one of those three-day photo hotels, do 400 interviews. And I said, I'm not doing that. And like, we're face to face in this office. And I said, I'm not doing that unless you swear to me you're spending the what you spend on a certain other kind of dimension film, uh, which would be 20 million ad budget. And he said, 
I will spend, that's what I'm spending, 20 million at budget. And we're face to face about two feet apart. And I'm looking at him and I said, uh, you're really telling me the truth. You're going to spend $20 million. And he said to me, gave me this look and he said, absolutely. And then I could see you know, all, all his mind wandering through our <laughs> relationship. <laughs> and, and he's thinking, oh, yeah, I reached the contract a couple of times. And he looked at me, he literally said this. I actually kind of like Bob Weinstein. I, I never argued, but Bob, he was a screamer and everything. But he had a real strange sense of humor. And he looked at me and he very sincerely said, you ask anyone in Hollywood, what is Bob Weinstein's word worth? And they will tell you it is worth gold. It is worth solid gold. There is nobody's worth whose word is worth more than Bob Weinstein. He said, my contracts are worth gold. Oh, no, my word is worth gold. My contracts aren't worth shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, that was so honest. I, okay. And then he didn't spend 20 million. He spent about three or something. Of course not. Of course not. Well, but I, I always I, valued that one. I think we've actually reached the end. I see that we're, uh, uh, we've been given the five minute warning five minutes ago. So, um, <laughs> I, I wish I had gotten to my last question, but maybe maybe they'll still be able to fit this in. Um, Stephen King once told me the secret to being a successful author was to stay married to the same person. <laughs> and it's clear that you have you followed you followed that same philosophy. Do you want to say anything about Gerda and and how that's been a partnership? It's it's been it's fifty six years, but we were together a few years before that. So I think we're heading towards sixty years together. And, uh, uh, yeah, she gave me the option when I was selling and books and stories, but not making a real living at it. She offered to support me for five years with her job and said, if you can't make it in five years, you'll never make it. It took almost the whole five years. Um, and then she was able to quit her job. And it's, I often say it's, it's, uh, we're like two plow horses in this that have been pulling it together all these years. And, uh, and it's, 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 I don't know, there's writers that don't stay married and still succeed, but I can imagine that first of all, once you're happy and together with somebody you love and get along with, all the emotional storm and drama of life is gone. And that makes you much more productive if you're not wasting your emotional energy on all the nonsense that goes on in so many lives. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that, that's been important to me. That's for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I agree with you perfectly. We don't need, we are writers. We don't need Sturm and Drang in our lives. We need <laughs> on the page, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dean. And I want to mention again, it's Quicksilver. And oh, I forgot to ask one more thing. Is this the beginning of a new series? No, it isn't. Uh, oh, yeah, a lot okay. of people are asking me that, but no, it's a standalone. I think I'm a, of an age. I shouldn't start a series. Just stay with standalone. Okay. All right. Well, I hope everybody gets a chance to read it because it is a fantastic book. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Dean. And thank you, Tess. Again, Dean Kuntz's novel is Quicksilver. Signed copies can be purchased in the link below and also in the comments section. Thanks again. And as we like to say, go on gently. <laughs>